the big overarching topics topic of this lecture and the ending of previous lecture was optimal mechanisms. This is once again just an alias for revenue maximizing mechanisms, aka profit maximizing mechanisms. So just to remind you, whenever I say revenue and profit, these mean the same thing for, for today at least. So what we did last time is we considered a very simple example of this uh, of this problem. So we looked at monopolistic screen. And this is a problem that I asked you to uh, finish at home. So what we did last time around is we wrote down the uh, actual problem. So it was maximize over k h t h k l t l and the expected revenue or profit was given by f phi it's not much better is it t h minus k h squared plus 1 minus phi times L minus k L squared. So once again, an even broader reminder is that this was a problem in which we were selling an item and we were designing the optimal mechanism to sell the item. And here k is the probability that a given type of the buyer, of which there are two, low valuation and high valuation. So k is the probability with which, or the quantity, sorry, of the item that the player of this type gets, and TL is the total price which the player pays for this, for this quantity. And so this is the expected profit of the seller. We assume that there, is, there are some quadratic costs of production. And then we had some constraints. So we originally had four constraints, two incentive compatibility conditions for the two types of the buyer. And then we had two individual rationality conditions, once again for two different types of the buyer to be willing to participate in the mechanism. And finally, what we did last time around is we took these four inequality constraints and we simplified them to two equality constraints. So we just looked at the problem very, very carefully and we saw that we do not need to solve this full problem with four constraints. We can substitute it with a simpler problem. And so the constraints that we ended up with were as follows, so uh, k h theta h minus t h should be equal to theta h k l minus t l and i r of the low type theta l k l minus t l must be equal to zero. All right, and what I asked you to do at home is to finish solving this problem. So we simplified it in class, we brought it to this form, and what you just needed to do was to derive the four values, KL, TL, KH, and TH. And so since this is something that you should have done, you tell me what these are. So what is KL? Can somebody tell me that? Yep, that's what I got in different form. That's good. We're off to a good start. All right, TL, somebody else. That's right. Yeah, I guess it's, this is easy to see from IRL. TL equals theta L times KL, so exactly this. So theta, write those horizontally. So TL will be equal to theta L times theta L minus Phi theta h divided by 2 times 1 minus phi. Good. Kh. Half theta h. That's it? That's actually right. <laughs> <laughs> I tricked to saying that this is the hardest part. I guess th is the hardest part. Good. All right. Uh, so the 
final, the final frontier. Who can tell me what TH is? No, no volunteers. Calling one, calling two, calling three, sold. I will not tell you what it is. But, so, uh, the takeaway here, we can still make some takeaways. Maybe TH will not be too important for our takeaways here. But what lessons can we extract from this very simple example with only two types? Anne Maria? Mm -hmm. So the question is uh, should we also check the case when uh, what the profits were if the seller only served the high type and did not care about the low type? This would I think this is captured in this problem, right? So this would be one of the solutions of this of this problem, if it were. So if KL is zero and TL is zero, it means exactly that. Then IRL holds, ICH becomes IR. No, we still would. So the, the question is, we would not uh, have an incentive to offer a menu. And in, in a sense, this is right. So let me frame it this way. Here, we are effectively offering a menu of three options. Uh, you can pretend to be high type, or you can report to be high type. You can pretend to be low type. Or you can say, I don't want to deal with this. Neither of these two options really uh, appeal to me. So I don't want to buy anything. This is the outside option. This is something that is always available to the player. So this is what we anchor to. In, in the case that you're describing, when we, are not, when we do not care about serving low type, just two of these options would be the same. The menu item intended for the low type would exactly be pay nothing and get nothing. So just walk away with nothing. But we would still need to satisfy the IC of the high type so that the high type does not want to report that he's low type and get nothing. It's just in that case, that condition would be exactly the same as individual rationality for the high type. OK, lessons, lessons, lessons. I promised you lessons. Uh, so a few, a few regularities that we can uh, find by looking at this problem. First of all, this problem differs from what we did so far. I guess I will put it down as a, as a lesson. A different problem from before. Any? In, and this is in the following sense. This is in the sense that uh, you can see it as a third stage of our analysis. So stage one is analyzing whether a given allocation function or a given social choice function is implementable or not. So you have some social choice function, you want to implement that, and you can test whether that is doable. So that's monotonicity. In part two, that we actually did first, you have some allocation rule, but you can design the transfers. And then the question is, do there exist, does there exist a transfer rule that supports the allocation rule that you want? Now we are in stage three, the final stage, where we are designing both the allocation rule and the transfer rule, having just some objective in mind. And here the objective is maximization of profit. So the difference is K is now also a uh, subject of choice. Now the insight about the qualitative conclusion about the selling problem. Uh, the first trivial one is that offering a menu of options can be optimal. and is indeed typically optimal. In the sense that if you are a seller and you are designing, you are choosing which price to set, you might want to not just set a price per unit, but you can set some non-linear pricing um, menu, saying that you know this amount costs this much, that amount costs this much, and so on. 
You look very puzzled, but you actually have you you have seen that many times. You see that you see this every time you go to a store. How much does a half a liter bottle of Coke cost? Just twenty. So, 0.5 liter is twenty. And how how much does the large bottle cost? The one and a half liter. Yeah. So I I, I think I think I've seen one and a half at fifteen. I I don't know what. This is, but let, let's say, for, for sake of example, to not ruin our beautiful theory, <laughs> let's say you can get it at 10. Maybe I should have told you about the can instead, 0.3, because that's closer to 10, maybe even less. But the point is, the prices do not differ by the same factor as the quantities do. So one half liter bottle does not cost five times as much as a can of Coke. And this is one manifestation of this kind of non-linear pricing. So, our model explains non-linear pricing. Another very related example is um, scoops of ice cream. Two scoops usually cost less than double times one scoop. What else? Now some qualitative conclusions. Uh, to get to the next insight, let us think for a second about the case in which buyer's type is known. So the seller knows whether uh, buyer's valuation is high or low. What would be the, now not the menu, but what would be the contract that the seller would then offer the buyer? So you would have max of uh, T minus K squared subject to a single IR constraint. There is no IC, just have IR for this buyer, theta k minus t, weekly greater than zero. It's obvious that this should bind, so t will be equal to theta k, and the optimal k would then be equal to theta over 2. Just to maximize this expression. So this is the full information benchmark. And now let's compare the conclusions that we had here with this contract. So we see that the high type gets exactly that amount. So the allocation for the high type is non-distorted, is not distorted. So KH is not distorted relative to full information benchmark. But if you look at KL, you will see that it is actually distorted and it is distorted downwards. So the way we can write KL down, just to rewrite it slightly, will be theta L over 2 minus uh, phi over 1 minus phi times theta h minus theta l over 2. And so this term is positive. So what we get is that kl is distorted downwards. So why does it happen? Why is our kl distorted downwards? The answer is to provide incentives. This is the whole thing. This is the only dimension in which these two problems differ. In that problem, we have to provide incentives to the types to reveal who they are. So by distorting the allocation of the low type downwards, quite possibly down to zero, so just completely ignoring the low valuation buyers, what we do, what that buys us, is that we can uh, extract more surplus from the high type. We have easier time extracting surplus from the high type. And the high type is the one that we want to deal with because the high type values item a lot, so is ready to pay a lot, contributes a lot in profits. So KL is distorted downwards to uh, because I see H. I will write it this way. It does not directly follow from the inequality, but 
the intuition does follow from there. And one, two final points. One is that if we are serving both types, both the high and the low type, then this ICH actually binds. And what this leads to is we cannot extract all of the surplus from the high evaluation bind. So this layer uh, leaves with some information right, with some positive surplus that we would have completely extracted in the full information benchmark. So because this high type can hide, can pretend to be low type, they get to leave a little bit of money uh, for themselves. So H gets positive information rate. And here by positive, I should mean weakly positive, because ignoring the low type and just extracting all surplus of the high type is always an option. But uh, yeah, if both types are served, then H gets strictly positive information rate. And finally, one final conclusion is that our incentive compatibility constraints thin down the relative prices and relative quantities that the two players get. But then we can scale both transfers up or down. And so we obviously want to set transfers as high as possible to maximize our revenue because transfers are our revenue. And so what we do, uh, what it means, is that there's, there's some upper bound on transfers. And this upper bound in our problem is given by IR constraints. So the conclusion here is that uh, at least some IR constraints bind, meaning that they are satisfied with equality. So these are the takeaways that we want to take away from the monopolistic screening problem that we solved last time around. What we will do today, starting after the break, is we will see that in the more general model, these uh, takeaways still hold, and so they apply more generally. So they hold not just in our simple example, but in the, in the more general thing as well. And the main thing that we will generalize in this uh, problem is the domain of preferences, so to say, of the buyer. So here, to, to guarantee that the mechanism exists, I guess, to some extent, we put a very restrictive assumption on what preferences the buyer can have. So we said buyer's preferences are one of the two types, either high valuation or a low valuation. Now we will relax this. We will allow the buyer to have one of the continuum of valuations, of the interval of valuations. And we will try to solve that more difficult problem. Uh, one thing, one thing that about the previous problem. We cannot have negative KLs there, right? We cannot produce negative amounts. But if you look at this KL, you will see that if phi is too large, and phi, if you remember, is the probability of high type, of the buyer having high valuation, then if this phi is high enough, this expression will be negative. So this k will be negative. So what to do? In that case, we do exactly what Anna Maria suggested. We say that well, k cannot be negative, kl cannot be negative, so the next best thing we can do is to set kl at zero, and in that case we will exactly have that single item menu under which we are only serving the high type. And so this is another lesson, another takeaway added to the list, which is that the distribution of types now really matters for the allocation, not just for transfers, but for the allocation itself. <laughs>